and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us from Loculus Games, the current developer of Chrono Rogue, a time punk RPG, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only Cal Shantz Hilton. How you guys? How you, how you doing today, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, I just got a new puppy, so um, that's awesome. Best of luck. Thank you. Yeah. So. A bit of a tradition is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh gosh, that um, so like a lot of kids, you know, like it started with making up stories, like on the playground, you know, not dice systems or anything. Um, I had a very dear friend um, who would run us through like his imagination basically and he would we would come up with characters and go on these adventures and we didn't roll dice we just sort of succeeded you know and he kind of told us the outcome of our actions mm -hmm. um but yeah at an early age i just i realized that i really loved telling stories you know and then i slowly got into um like ad and d was the first D, &D that i was introduced to um and uh, I got into Palladium games slightly before that. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness, mm -hmm. um, Heroes Unlimited, uh, Rifts, uh, eventually Rifts. Um, and I played a little like old school Lord of the Rings. Um, I think sure. it was, it might have been One Ring back then, like the first, first, first edition. I don't um, remember. If, it, if, you're, if you're going back that far, it was probably Merp. Yeah, I don't remember, like, a friend's dad ran us through it, and I was just, you know, I had read, like, The Hobbit, and I loved Lord of the Rings, so, you know, I was yeah, like, yeah, the yeah. One, the One Ring was a few years ago. Oh, okay. I couldn't remember if they had an older, older, older edition, because, you know, like, you know, Palladium's just coming out with uh, another um, edition of TMNT, you know, mm -hmm. and that was back in, like, the late 80s, early 90s, so. Yeah, and... I, I was aware of it, though I don't, I don't plan on doing any deep dives because I... <laughs> I, navigate, I have issues with how navigation works in a lot of Palladium books. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, Palladium, like, I, I loved the game systems back then, but, like, it took a really long time to make characters. Like, six hours or something. Um... And that started to become a bit of a drain for playing. Mm -hmm. So, was Chrono Rogue something that you had been that you had been kicking around for a while, or was it a concept that has a more recent point of origin? Um, I was kicking it around for a while. Um, I, like the entire project's probably like five years old. Um, you know, I came up with the concept of like time traveling heists and how that would work, and you know, like. I had never really written a game system. Like I've written game systems before that, but they just were kind of, kind of um, mostly adaptations to existing systems, like Shadowrun or something like that. You know, same concept. You know, attribute plus skill in dice pool kind of thing. Um, yeah, I just so wanted to. The dice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been playing Shadowrun since second edition, and you know, I haven't played sixth, but. Uh, fifth and fourth were kind of like losing me because of the amount of dice and then they tried to curb it and it didn't quite work as well as I had hoped you know so I still love the world and really it was it was building a world that kind of brought me to Chrono Rogue like how would someone handle um, time travel in an RPG um, and like how would it work and then it sort of evolved from there mm -hmm. and that brings me to the fact that you call you call Chrono Rogue a time punk game. Yeah, what that exactly um, does that entail? So um, a lot of people like have kind of um, interpreted the you know the punk moniker on the end of things as uh, a variety of different things. To me, I learned it as the technology is 
part of society and also an undercurrent element of the game is resisting um, some kind of authority. So I came up with Time Punk later because it kind of just sort of naturally evolved. Like I had built a like a society of oppress. I built several societies of oppressive government that like stand over all the main character, like all of the characters. And so my thought process was that like since time travel is the technology that sort of drives everything now, and your characters are all resisting this authority, like it made sense to call it time punk. And then I was like looking around, and no one else had done it, so I was like, at least I'll be, you know, unique, um, you know, with that. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now, I did go I did go through the start the starter kit, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. glad that was out there, so it makes my job significantly easier. I don't I don't like flying blind with this kind of thing. But no, totally. When it comes to when it comes to games, I've I've always I've always extolled the concept of an all roads lead to Rome, essentially a, a core mechanic where that um is the is the central way that randomization is used because not I wasn't gonna say dice rolls, but not every game is gonna use dice. No, that's correct. Any randomizer. That's one of those traps that a lot of people fall into, thinking that you need dice. Mm -hmm. Um but what it what is the what is the central system when it comes to when it comes to resolving that um, act those actions where you might have success or failure. Um, so uh, basically, most skill checks and resistance rolls and things like that, attack rolls, are two d ten plus um, a rating. And um, I sort of adopted the meet it, beat it um, kind of uh, you know system, similar to Dungeons and Dragons, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> only because um, I believe like that combat should always be moving towards an end. You know, like. Combat should be moving a story along, even if it's combat, you know, like you should be moving towards an end. And, you know, some systems like old school white wolf systems would be like ties go to the defender and things like that. And I just, I suddenly sort of dawned on me, I was like, but that makes everything go longer. And we've all been in a D Dungeons and Dragons combat that has taken, you know, like four hours for 24 seconds worth of in-game combat. And you feel sometimes like this has gone on too long. You know, so I kind of tried to make the game so that, you know, your your skill ratings and things like that could um, actually affect the outcome of combat quicker. Mm -hmm. I can I can definitely understand that. Now, with with that said, uh, I also could I also could not but know that you have you have a fairly extensive skill system, but you're also if I'm. Re if I'm reading this right, utilizing something of a class system? Uh, yes, but it's only, like, it's only a starting point. Like, I, I have to, like, iterate that as hard as possible. Like, I wanted people, because so many characters are going to be snatched out of time in some way, that having them have a starting skill set felt like a good grounding place for players. Um, you know, so they could picture, like, I'm a doctor in World War II, you know, like, and I'm helping the French resistance, you know, have no power. And all of a sudden I'm wrapped up in this weird, like weird technological time heist thing. And I, I may help some characters on this, you know, ship and they might be like, Hey, you can get out of this hell right now if you want to join us. And there's a vast world for you to, you know, come and join. And like, where would that person start as skill sets? Um, like, I kind of liked the idea that they would start with certain abilities and then it would move on from there. So there are core classes, but it's not like you can, you're encouraged to go bizarrely different after you start with your core class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can, cer I can certainly make, so make some, make some sense out of that. Now with that, with that in mind, so would it be fair to say that that it's a that what would be classes in other games are archetypes in Chrono Rogue? Uh, yes and no. Like, um, usually, like archetypes are you know you're the face or the this or the that. You know, like Shadowrun had a bunch of archetypes, but they didn't really say like this is a character class. It was like a type. You know, like the street samurai or the um or the Decker. You know, for instance. Um, 
And, you know, like more games these days are coming up with playbooks, you know, like Powered by the Apocalypse is doing is really heavy into playbooks, you know, which kind of sets you into like a, a, a role, you know, and you can build roles in the game. But I wanted there to be just more roads to get to a role than just sort of being like, I could take, you know, a fallen noble and give them a bunch of social yeah. skills and, you know, I'm the face. You know, I wanted it to be like, you could be a weird, twisted void mutant and still be the face. Like, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I, I do want to, I do want to clear, whenever I talk about archetypes in role-playing games, it's all, it's always meant to be like a starting, a starting package or a starting leaning. Yeah. So I guess, yes. Um, in that case, if, if that's, if that's the, yeah, the common language we're using, then yes, I would say mm -hmm. that they're, they are definitely fall into archetypes then. Yeah. Though, unless I'm mistaken, the, you since we've since we've brought up Shadowrun, you don't have the um, advantage disadvantage setup that it has, or that or that other games would have. In st but you do have the concept of edges. Um. So edges are basically just another term for talent trees. Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to write a game that people could play for a really long time. You know, because like. Um, I've played, you know, eight year long vampire games and things like that. And I've had a really good experience doing that, you know, like, um, having these characters go through these kind of like epic journeys has been kind of the thing I've done, you know, most recently I've gotten into more short form, um, like halfway through writing Chrono Rogue, I started getting into like Blades in the Dark and stuff like that, you know, so I'm appreciating short stories now, you know, and not always just being like, well, this is a epic, you know, four year long campaign whenever I start. Um, so yeah, edges are basically talent trees. And I wanted people to be able to like build, um, have as many options as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a lot of options in the full rules, like the, there are so many more than in the starter kit. Uh, yeah. Um, what I did, what I did notice is the different die types that are associated with attributes, which leads me to ask if, um, if resolution is more dice focused than it is on static modifiers. Uh, it's both. So um, you can get what's called skill dice um, added to your uh, rating. Um, it's not as defined as well in the, um, in the, like light rules but basically it's like you could get if you got like a good piece of equipment or something mm -hmm. it would give you a d8 you know instead of a d4 you know if you had like a crappier version of equipment like everything in this game is customizable um your gear is completely customizable you might have this like sword that you really love and you just keep building on it you know you can get it master crafted to give it extra hard points to or in order to like improve its damage or its pierce quality or give it the ability to um, poison better, you know, like stuff like that. I wanted everyone to be able to be like, wow, I can just go shopping for, you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff, you know? Yeah. Is there any extra effect if somebody, if somebody rolls a, stri a straight 20 or rolls snake eyes with that 10 yeah. 10 setup? Yep. So um, in this game, uh, if you beat any sort of situation, like if there's a static DC or an opposed roll and you beat it by five, um, you get to add your own narrative flair into the story. So I, the storyteller is encouraged not to tell them what happens. They're encouraged to tell the storyteller what happens. Like um, if I'm, if the difficulty to pick a lock is 15, you know, for the window and there's like a guard inside um, mm -hmm. and the player rolls a 20, um, they'll be like, oh, well, how about this? I get the door open and the guard doesn't see me, giving me a chance to ambush them or mm -hmm. wait till they pass by. Um, if you roll two uh, tens, it counts as a 25 instead of just a 20. So you get that automatic five bonus if you roll a 20, you know. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to when it comes to skills, is it a, is it a case where when ma when making a roll, it, is it a case where the skill ranking is just a, is just adding a, a set number or is there a different? It group? is. No, no, it's um, it's just adding a, a a set number. I wanted I wanted like the calculation to be relatively quick, if you can, you know. So, other than skill dice, um, you're you're rolling your yeah, you're adding just a, a static at, like a static skill um or resistance roll basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can I can cert I can certainly get behind that. 
now when it comes to when it comes to edges um i'm guess i'm guessing that with each of the with each of the categories you're going to have um basic techniques which you which i already see in there but are there going to be advanced techniques in the full book where they're more powerful but you need to have had a few techniques in the on the basic tier in order to get them yes uh for instance, um, like uh, the stealth um, edge, uh, one of the advanced abilities allows you, if you successfully attack from stealth, you can ignore a target's hardship and directly take off of their wounds. So it's like you're building kind of the perfect assassin for the system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And when it comes to beat cost for it, for, for it is it? Is that a case where you're spending that part of the action economy? Yeah, so I wanted, because um, I wanted everything to be customizable, of course, I wanted combat to be customizable too, which may be good and may be bad. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but, you know, like, I like the way it's going because it gives people options. So basically, you get an offensive beat and a defensive, you get two beats, and you can choose what they, what they are, offensive or defensive. So if you choose to establish defense at the start of combat, and everyone has the option to do that, um, unless you're ambushed, um, you basically get to be like, okay, so I feel like this is a really tough opponent, so I'm going to spend, you know, I'm going to definitely establish defense. So if someone attacks you, you get to roll your dodge or your melee parry in order to, like, deflect the attack. And again, it's you know, attackers attackers beat defenders if they tie. Um, but if you <clears throat> um, basically like, uh, basically like, I just sort of wanted um, it to be that like, I just sort of wanted it to be that like. Um, sorry, ask the question again. I'm getting a little distracted. Um, this this has to do mostly with how the oh yeah beat economy yep. yeah so if you get a if you have a defensive edge or if you have a defensive beat um basically you can use a defensive edge um mm -hmm. if someone attacks you and you have a defensive edge available and you you can roll to defend as many times as you want but you also get uh you also get basically the ability to use a defensive edge as well mm -hmm. yeah which def definitely makes sense now. When it comes to in, when it comes to invocations, which would it be fair of me to say that invocations are a sister to edge, but also act as the equivalent of spells in this system? Yeah, I mean they're they're more closely um, associated uh, with spells than they are with edges. Um, they do some of the similar things to edges, but usually much better. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, like everyone can learn the different you know let's call it schools of magic, but it's really like schools of time and space manipulation mm -hmm. <clears throat> um and there are basic um intermediate and advanced um techniques for those as well um and those are used with a sort of slightly different system because you do have to roll a dice pool to invoke and get successes to invoke um lower middle or higher level abilities mm -hmm. um and you know like the more uh the more of a certain um trait called paradox that your character has the better they are at spell casting i feel so, like there's a catch with paradox though yes um so the game was predicated on building a piece of technology because it was all about time travel i had to i had to first deal with the grandfather paradox you know like what happens if i go back and kill my grandfather before i was born what would happen because that's the thing like you know uh, being someone who was talked about time travel and loves Doctor Who and loves, you know, Star Trek, TNG, and, and you know, all the different sci-fi things that have done it. You know, I had to basically go back and deal with that. <clears throat> so I built a piece of technology into the game uh, called the Paradox Field, which means that whatever you do and whatever happens in your character's past doesn't affect its present. So then that starter spiraling out into a multiverse, you know, um, which is what the game kind of engages in. Um, paradox is a trait that the more you mess with time, the more you accumulate uh, temporary paradox and then permanent paradox. You can get rid of uh, temporary paradox. You cannot get rid of permanent paradox. Um, when you have 20 points of temporary paradox, you get a one point of permanent paradox. And if you get 10 points of permanent paradox, your character is erased and nothing can save them. 
Mm-hmm. So you get more powerful at spell casting, but your chances of dying permanently are much higher because um, you actually have uh, technology in the game that can snatch you from death um, like before dying in the game. So <clears throat> your sh- everyone's ship has uh, what's called a resurrection cradle. And so if you die in the battlefield, your resurrection cradle will like snatch you a moment before you die and resurrect you there um, back on the ship but you get a permanent point of paradox for that. So you can only die nine times in the mm-hmm. game. Which def- definitely makes sense. And you meant you mentioned what what amounted to schools of to the equivalent of schools of magic. What would those schools be because I do think it's important to establish that invocations is all about messing with time messing with space time, not necessarily the usual affairs with magic. Uh, Correct. It is pretty specific, but that being said, um, I think that there's a wide range of things that people can do. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's see, I'll go through the schools of magic, if you'd like. Uh, So, agitation is the ability to speed up time. Um, And so... What that sort of translated to my brain was like, if you're speeding up molecular, you know, sort of like the molecules of whatever you're dealing with, you're probably going to catch it on fire eventually. You're increasing heat, you know. Mm -hmm. I tried to put a little actual science into the, you know, the science fiction um, meta plot, as it were. So agitation is about increasing your own speed, um, starting fires, creating like a flame aura if you want to, um, and inflicting damage mostly um, to people. Mm -hmm. Um, anarchy is dealing with entropy and um, destruction so if your character um, wants you can create like uh, basically a rift um, in space like as thin as you want and use it as a weapon so you're basically like using a tear in reality to slice through your foes Um, you can use it to disintegrate doors like if you come across a door that you're you know, your lockpick guy can't pick, you could just touch the door and age it so it rots away. Mm-hmm. Which, I should have asked this before, but what would what would you say would be, so, would be some of the shows, bo- books, or, or what have you that served as influences? We already, we already mentioned oh, okay. stuff like Shadowrun, um, Run, but I'm, so, I'm curious well, about the non-RPG inspirations that you draw upon okay um i am a, a sucker for a story where a ragtag group is in a busted ass ship trying to like do something against incredible odds and that was firefly. probably like oh yeah absolutely i love firefly probably, um probably you know but also like cowboy bebop as well yep uh <laughs> you know uh han solo you know like millennium falcon that ship you know just remember really hot tough. shot first what Han shot first. Oh yeah, Han shot, shot first, of course. You know. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Star Trek. Um, probably a little Star Wars in there. Um, oh, we already mentioned Han Solo, so. Yep. Yeah, uh, Doctor Who, um, of course. Uh, a little bit of Hyperion, which is a book, not a not a movie. Um, in that series. Um. Probably a little bit of Lies of Locke Lamora in there because I wanted to be able to like have the sort of a thieves um, kind of idea behind it all. Um, I would say like some video games, old old video games um, that had to do with time travel too. Um, probably influenced me, you know, in my subconscious. <clears throat> but Time Bandits, um, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I probably could think of more, but yeah. <laughs> that's a list. <laughs> There's there are there are a few other bits of media. I'm cu- I'm curious if they've been brought up to you. Um, one of them is Quantum Break. I haven't seen Quantum Break. Is it good? Um, uh, it is interesting. I do as for, on its own, it has some interesting concepts. Gameplay wise, it doesn't quite get it doesn't quite get it down pat because it's trying to do two things at once. Oh, in t- but in terms of the in in terms of the time travel, it is trying to be somewhat grounded with it. Um, 
when I compare it to the rest of Remedy's library, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it up on the same tier as like Max Payne or even Alan Wake or Control. I still haven't played okay. Alan Wake two though. Um, I haven't played it either. I loved the first game. Yeah, but it's Quantum Break was the was the first one where Sam Lake was not involved in the writing. And okay. it kind of takes itself seriously, especially since um, they did they did this web they did this web series that's inter that has integrated junctions within the game, which is a bold concept, especially since they got people who had worked on shows like The Wire to help out. Mm -hmm. But it's one it's one of those things where I think I think everything didn't quite click, and it kind of takes. That same level of humor that's within that's within a lot of Remedy's work, um, isn't quite there. Okay. Which is which is why I said when I finally played Control that Control feels more like a Remedy feels more like a Remedy game, even if it's not my cup of tea. It right. Yeah, I liked Control, um, but I definitely saw some points in it that like I think that they could have done a little smoother. Um, but I mean, like the gameplay was was really, I think, what you played control for, not necessarily the story as much. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you can do. I think you can do both. Yeah, I, I think so too. But part part of the reason I say it it feel it feels more like re, more like remedy because um part one of the first things I noticed was they was poets of the fall coming back to do some music for it. And that band has been friends with Sam Lake for years. Even get even, they even contributed to um, the original Max Payne before they're out, putting some tracks on that before their album was even out. Oh, okay. Um, your so your your background lore of this is is much more extensive than mine. I have to admit. I'm a researcher by by trade and by and by habit. And yeah. finding and finding the story of how things are made is always going to be fascinating. Another time travel entry that I I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up is an indie film that came out in two thousand four called Primer. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it yet, um, but I've I definitely heard of it. Um, it is definitely the most grounded use of time travel, especially with the rule of only being able to go back. I think it was like two hours. Mm hmm. Yeah, they've done they've done that kind of a concept before. I think there was a show um, back in the '90s. I don't remember what it was called, but it was like a guy could go back eight hours in some kind of time chamber that was kind of a rip off of Contact. Mm -hmm. Although, although, um, how much are you really ripping off if you're ripping off Contact? Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I mean, I, I I still have to read the book to see if um, you know, like. Uh, the movie was, you know, garbage. You know how it is. Sometimes the movie is garbage, and the book is actually okay. Yeah. Uh, and some sometimes you can have cases where they're both good in different ways. Yeah, I think like Jurassic Park, the book was really good, and the movie was really good. You know, like, but in different ways. Like, I could see how they didn't want to adapt like all the chaos math that was in the book into the movie. I'm, st I'm still not entirely sure if Crichton understood if Crichton understands chaos theory. I mean, he could he could just be like a complete hack, you know, like basically the Dan Brown of you know ten to fifteen years earlier or something like that. <laughs> that is that is certainly po that is certainly possible. I've well, I've 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 seen I've read through Dan Dan Brown's other stuff, and really, he only had one trick on him. Oh yeah, I know. He basically took uh, goosebumps. You know, uh, you know. Let's leave him on a cliffhanger at the end of every chapter, so you keep reading, and then you get done, and you're like, "Wow, I just read a pile of garbage." You know, and I've read a lot of goosebumps books in my in my youth, but I was like reading, and I was like, "This feels like when I read goosebumps, like middle school, and you know, or earlier." You know, I don't remember when I read goosebumps, but at least with goosebumps, it's doing that because it's aiming at a much younger audience. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Now, a lot of since we're leaning into, uh, and I I do have to apologize for getting off that tangent because uh, you good. mentioned anarchy. I, th I don't think you got into the other ones. No, like, um, no. Con um, conservation, for instance. 
Okay, so conservation is the opposite of agitation, basically like that slowing down molecular um, shenanigans so that you can create ice bolts, walls of ice, um, fields of ice that people can slip, slip on, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, yep. Displacement? So displacement is your, your classic uh, teleporting around. Um, it's moving of space, not uh, necessarily time. Mm -hmm. um, at higher levels, you're able to create um, these sort of side side pockets of space that you can hide in if you want to or you can send people like into these little side pockets of space so that they're like their actions are going to come later giving your team like the opportunity to clean up you know like if there are mobs or other enemies you can like you know get rid of some of them before something tough comes back into the field giving you the opportunity to like lessen the, their impact mm -hmm. and malarkey um, malarkey is uh, basically a, predict a social predictive um, power where you can work out what someone's going to say or what the best thing to say is because you kind of are reading it a little a few moments in the future. So you're like, oh, well, this guy, you know, it's, it's everything from I'm making people kind of randomly walk up to me and tell me some of the basic secrets about the city and then up to like being able to sort of brick someone's um psyche so that they love you you know or something because you're just saying the, all the right things you know that kind of thing um the thing that's in the core rules that isn't in the light rules is there is actually social combat so you can do things like um you can erode someone's status wounds um they're called and when they're gone uh you can get them to do you favors and there's a massive list for you know, a variety of things. Like if you're in in medieval times, you can get the equivalent of like the doctor of the time to basically close down an entire district if you have enough points of um, from beating them in social combat and they're important enough, you can basically get them to be like, I'm going to close down this whole district and call a fake plague, you know, giving you and your, your fellows the chance to get somewhere that you need to without like City Watch being a problem. Yeah. And I'm guessing you do. I'm guessing with social combat, you do have edges that can potentially be taken to. Yes. Make um, yeah. Uh, there's one called Noble Main, which is um, the basically the the best social edge. Um, but yeah, Malarkey does what some of what Noble Main does, but just does it way better. Yeah. And speaking of that, when it comes to edges and invocations, um, are it. I'm guessing you're pretty light on the prerequisites. We're not going to be dealing with the rid the ridiculous feet taxes or anything like that. No, no, nothing like that. Because, like, yeah, I, I played, you know, 3-5, th and uh, sometimes it took a really long time to get the thing that you wanted. Whirlwind um, attack is my whipping boy for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, basically, like, if you have one previous um, level of a power, uh, you can usually get the next one. There are a few, like... Um, there are a few uh, exceptions, but mostly the rule is if you have a basic, you can buy an intermediate. Mm -hmm. And if you have an inter intermediate, you can buy a, an advance in a school or an edge um, so talent you, tree. You just, you just need one from the previous tier. That yeah. Because I was figure I was like, I was going to let, I, I can't like not let people buy lesser things to learn greater things. You know, like I wanted there to be at least some kind of road. But the thing is like, there are, 18 powers per school so in total there's six in each um basic um intermediate and advanced so you have a lot of options and i'm guessing you're taking the approach of xp as currency instead of a level system um yeah because level systems don't work really um i haven't come across a game that has really made it work like you know, I, I, I remember uh, Brennan Lee Mulligan said that, like, you know, if you're not using a milestone system of some kind, you know, in D&D, &D, if you're a wizard, it makes more sense for you to be going out and beating the crap out of goblins instead of learning your spells from books, you know, because it's just like, and that makes sense. It's like, if you're just getting XP, you know, from, from monsters, you know, and then leveling up that way. It just it just doesn't really work. Like I appreciate leveled things, you know, like from classes, but for XP systems, yeah, I wanted a, a milestone system instead. I've seen I've seen some games that are t that are taking um, XP for leveling in the sense of you're not leveling from just killing monsters; you're leveling from 
completing missions, which I think is a smarter approach. I agree with you. I think um, completing your tasks. And, um, you know, if I build systems in the future, I will probably go even more personal than that. Like, defining it with a character would probably be my next move. Like, what is this guy's goal, you know? And what are the steps? And what do you think would be the, you know, like the milestone accomplishments for this guy's goal? Yeah. You know, there's a YouTuber I follow who would who um because he does a lot of stuff with multiplayer shooters would have the would have the tagline PTFO, which is shorthand for play the fucking objective. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because you know, mostly, you know, it's like what I think it kind of boils down to like what you want the game loop to be yeah. of your game. You know, so it's like if the game loop is the objective, you have to do it. You know, mm -hmm. like. Otherwise, you know, like you can do all the side tangents in the world and, you know, you can have a really great game. But if the game mechanics say, like, you have to go complete the objective and that's the game loop, you know. But luckily now there are games that are sort of expanding what the definition of the game loop is, you know, and not really making that the core thing. Like, I, you know, like, uh, what is it? Um, Wanderlust has a very open ended, you know, game loop and doesn't have a dice system, you know. Yeah, and it's always it's always important to establish what um, I remember. I remember a developer at Bungie referring to the thirty seconds of fun. Although he's since gone on record saying he doesn't like how people misinterpreted what he was trying to say, because uh, he had said if you if you can make thirty seconds of fun, you can stretch that out into a whole game. The yeah, the um, in the intent was not just create 30 seconds and then that's it no you have to keep iterating and, and keep um and keep altering it um, yeah i mean like i think i think I, it might have been bungee but they came up with the like you know if you're at a certain health um you know bad guys will come out and spray bullets but like it's built that they'll miss you you know but it's just to make you like get that little adrenaline spike like oh i almost died you know I don't know if it was Bungie that did that because because I have never forgiven them for for le for legendary back in the Halo two. <laughs> oh yeah, and just how absolute BS that wa that was. Um, that whole experience is weird for me because I was raised on um, Marathon and Marathon Infinity, like way back in the day, the two D one. Then let then let me bring up some pain that I know you will know. Mm -hmm. Colony ship for sale, cheap. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And that's that. I know that I know that they had said that that was a grievous sin. To which I say, then how how come how come you didn't how come you did it you did it worse with a converted church in Venice, Italy? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I uh, yeah. I, I I I still have like you know despite all its problems, I still have fond memories of running through that game and. It's just, like I, wondering if a bob was going to explode in my face. I I like I like Marathon, don't don't get me wrong. Um I just I just like um take I just like taking the piss out of the, out of those moments. Yeah. I I can I can appreciate that. Yeah. Uh especially especially since it, it will always be funny to me that Marathon 2, not not Marathon 2, um the original Marathon and um Rise of the Triad were are both credited as the first shooters to in, to incorporate dual wielding, and they came out the mm -hmm. same day. Oh, really? I didn't know they came out the same day. That's uh, that's funny. Yeah, and I suppose, and technically speaking, I suppose like can, I suppose we can add Marathon Infinity to the li to the list of um, time travel rabbit holes. Yep, yep. There were a few of those, and and rocket jumps as well. I'd say it may it may have invented it, but I'd say I'd say the um the more the most I'd say Quake made them user friendly. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Now within a lot of blank punk kind of games, there's always a bit there's always a big deal made of customization, and I do see that to a point, especially with the concept of chronotech equipment. Yes. So, what exactly what exactly makes Chronotech equipment unique and therefore expensive? 
Um, well, uh, Chronotech equipment is actually all all equipment is is customizable. You can get you know a mundane melee sword and customize it. But um, so Chronotech uh, Chronotech equipment basically usually draws on the power of your Chronotech suit that you have or Paradox suit. Um, it's something that all Chrono Rogues have to wear when they're out in the field because um, because time has been so unraveled in humanity's past. If you don't wear one, you get unraveled yourself so everyone has one of these suits and they're from like a simple belt that projects a field around you to um some pretty like nasty heavy armor um that gives you some pretty good bonuses in mm-hmm. melee combat um so basically like uh that could be um it could be like uh you have a a ring that contains um the rubble of like like an eight by eight or a 12 by 12 room full of rubble that you can just basically open up in a dimensional door and like throw it at your enemy so that they can't get after you, Mm -hmm. you know, or it's a grenade that is kept in stasis, but the pin has been pulled and you can just sort of throw that at your enemies, you know, so it goes off like, or a shotgun shell that's been shot, but is held in stasis and you're just basically releasing the stasis bubble, um, stuff like that. And uh, I wanted all of that to be customizable as well. It draws power from your suit, and the payoff is that, like, you basically, um, you can shoot more often. Um, Ballistic weapons and, ballistic weapons in Chrono Rogue, uh, depending on when they were made, um, have a a potential problem. Because you've been messing with time so much, post-1950s technology um, starts breaking down when you try to interact with it. So there's actually a whole school or a whole um, edge tree that will mitigate that and give you bonuses. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, uh, one one thing that can be particularly tricky with freeform character creation has to do with the how how you t- how you tear up the opposition. Some games yes. will do. Some games will do this where you're creating um, the opposition, whether it be monsters, NPCs, whatever you want to call them. Um, the same way you do characters, which has its own upsides and downsides. Some will ju- will just not bother, and some will have some broad difficulty tier uh, for NPCs. What approach do you have with the with the other side of the glass? Okay, so I came to the realization after the game was all done that building encounters for it would be um, potentially uh, potentially hard for for a GM um, because there's so many options. So you could waste a ton of time. So basically, like I kind of pulled a, a I don't know if you're familiar with Bertold Brecht. Um, he is a he's a playwright um, mm-hmm. who liked basically deconstructing his plays. So I deconstructed the game into a basic point system um, for storytellers. So it takes basically like what the XP um, level of the players are and gives you a point value that you can spend on encounters for them, like as, you know, just for combat. Um, And it deconstructs what the cost of the different like stack types are that you could inflict attack bonus, dodge bonus. Um, it doesn't deal with a lot of the skills that wouldn't be applicable in like a combat situation. Like, you know, there's a very little chance that the the character would need, you know, animal handling of any kind. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so, like, there are basically three stages of it in the game. Like, you can go through and, you know, if you want to build NPCs that way and, like, go through all of the edges and everything and XP costs and just basically work out how much would be a threat for your players of the equivalent level, you can do that. But if you don't want to do that, there is a very simple, quick um, point system guide at the end of the book for storytellers to basically break it down, spend their points, you know, they can custom build stacks into their enemies and, you know, kind of describe them. And I gave examples with point breakdowns. So Mm -hmm. they have from different eras. So like, you know, everything from a uh, Yakuza assassin to like a World War Two infantryman, you know, is in there. Although, if... for some reason, when you mentioned World War Two infantryman, all all of a sudden I ended up thinking of of um, Imel Koivinen. 
who would would make a very interesting, if insane, NPC in somebody's campaign in this setup. They should do it. You know, I I, I want everyone to tell their to tell their stories. You know, yeah. that's that's why I built oh. this game. The the short version with with Imo, if you if you don't know his full story, he was a soldier during the Finnish Winter War who um, ended up taking too much pervitin, and pervitin was a stimulant around that time that was basically meth. It was, oh, wow. it was basically it was based not just any but but raw medical grade stuff. <laughs> wow! He ended up taking his whole unit's worth of it, and had had the trip of a lifetime that should have killed him, but somehow didn't. And, and he it ended it ended up in one of those infamous kind of stories. I think one of the one of the worst cases, one of the early warning signs was hit was. Finding finding a cabin goes in cabin's booby trapped, so he get, he gets blown up. Goes in anyways, <laughs> sets a fire. Doesn't set it in the fireplace. Goes to sleep, sets the cabin on fire. Just <laughs> and instead instead of trying to put the fire out, just goes right outside. Goes right outside as the cabin is on fire and goes right back to sleep. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. That's there, a crazy story. Yeah, um, that would that would totally work in this game. Yeah, or him thinking that he got attacked by a wolverine, and and having to re having to wrestle it down and stab it with his knife. No, wait, that's not his knife. It's his compass. He just broke it, and he and he was he was hitting it against the log. <laughs> I mean, I guess the I guess the um the moral of the story is don't do meth. Um. <laughs> oh. He also had he also had a resting heart he also had a heart rate of I think two hundred BPM. So he was a he was a juicer from rifts to yeah. <laughs> Pretty, I think even I think even the juicers would tell would tell him to would tell him to calm. Yeah, down. like hey dude, you're you're harshing our mellow. <laughs> we don't have any mellow. Yeah. Uh, although I don't I don't know what. It, one of the other things about him was lo was losing part of his leg as because of because of a landmine. I don't know what it is with Finnish soldiers and landmines. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, it was probably <laughs> based on where they were. I'm guessing where they were directed to fight. I'm guessing there were a lot of minefields. Well, it's Finland, where it's where it's cold all the time and it's snowy all the time. Yeah, I guess that would be a good tactic to hide under the snow. Yeah, but. Now, given given the fact that we're dealing with time tra time travel and mm -hmm. going all over the place, um, in the full book, do you plan on ha on having equipment that accounts for different eras, different tech levels, and the like? Yeah, I mean, like um, a well balanced character should probably have uh, an archaic weapon that they're good at, and a you know um, a more modern one just in case. But like, you don't. It doesn't. It doesn't really like uh, it doesn't really discourage that. There's um, if you use technology that you shouldn't have in a previous era, mm -hmm. um, the thing that you have to worry about is something called harmonic resonance, and that's what the oppressive government that has outlawed time travel because of its consequences. Um, they basically use that to track you. Mm -hmm. So they have this um, they have this device called a Codex Fabricum that um, reads all existing like literature that's transcribed onto it so people might record that like someone used you know a lightning stick you know in an in a wild west setting you know and that that piece of literature might end up in the codex fabricum and they use it to predict where your crew is going to go so as you grow in um a variety of like as you get more and more infamous they start tracking you down faster mm -hmm. um so you can like work on basically getting rid of it, similar to like a heat mechanic in um, Blades in the Dark. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I just uh, you should probably buy an archaic weapon and a, a modern weapon just to give you a wider range of things. But it's not like it's not like you can't do it. Um, I thought of pretty much everything in terms of like what what would make you be able to work in different timelines. You know, like, people are given a device that allows them to speak the language whenever they're given a job, so that they can speak and read the language when they get there. Um, 
you know, people are given costumes for that are area era appropriate by um, the client. Some in some cases, you know, that kind of thing. When you mention the client, that that carries the implication that there's an equivalent of the fixer or Mr. Johnson within the set. Yeah, I mean, like I really loved that element of Shadowrun. Um, you know, like yes, it's these giant corporations that are basically you know dicking each other over um, and all the players are the foot soldiers that, for their will, you know, and that part of the game, like I really liked. Um, so I wanted there to be like this oppressive government that also, you know, you might get a job from one of them, or there are these people called void barons that um, live out in the vast void of space between timelines. Mm -hmm. um, and they could be the ones that are hiring you and you don't always know. And that's kind of like, what the game um that's kind of like the direction you want to take it uh if you if your gm and your players want to take it you can be like oh i want to find out why this void baron hired me like what is it about this painting they want me to steal that's so important is there something inside it you know mm -hmm. and do they like take that rabbit hole down to its end or do they just like go with the flow and they're like yeah we'll get you that painting no questions asked i don't i don't really care you know mm -hmm. and both methods are acceptable mm-hmm so, with the, with that said, uh, given the, given the custom given the customization, do you plan on putting advice for players and GMs to add, to add in their add in their own um their own te their own edges or in, or invocations or even equipment? Um. Yeah, I think I, I like I haven't and I haven't really like directly stated it, but I. I'm not really a huge control freak when it comes to like, you know, like if you find a way that the game will work better for you, I, I'm a big believer in the rule of cool. I don't think mechanics should get in the way of fun. So rule if zero. players, yeah, like if players want to like come up with their own stuff, please, like that's amazing. I, w I would love for there to be like a community of people that are excited about coming up with their own powers and being like, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? I'd be like, that's amazing. That, that sounds great. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that's all. That's always uh, that's always something that should be that should be strived for in RPGs. It's yeah. I mean, I'm also you know we're all kind of reeling from the sting of the the OGL kind of thing, you know, and it kind of makes us all feel like the goal is for us all to have fun, yeah. you know, like that's the goal, you know, and like. The fact that wizards tried to, you know, do all that. I mean, this is beating a dead horse. This has been the, talked about ad, ad nauseum. Thing, the funny thing about that is it is a case of those who do not learn from history because um, in the tail end of, T of TSR, especially when um, when, L when Lorraine was, ri was really in charge, there there was that attitude of, shut, of trying to shut down house rules or... or or um, having that same level, trying to have that same level of control, yeah. With the argument of you wouldn't use custom rules in a, in a at a chess tournament, which is a very a very bad argument because this is there are custom rules in chess tournaments sometimes, and there yeah. are different forms of chess, and like the counter. I remember if I was around back then, the counterpoint I would I would have said just to be a smart aleck is nobody plays Uno as written. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> but anyway, just like even just taking RPGs, like the the idea that your game can do everything, like mm -hmm. my game can't do everything, you know, and no the one's game games, can really do the everything. Only, the only ones that can are universal games, and that comes with its own. Yeah, it comes with its own problem, and it's like I think that um, Wizards trying to shut down, you know, homebrew rules. It's like though there are third party people that are keeping your game alive, you know, like. I think third-party content is really important. You know, if yeah. there are people that want to build third-party content for my game, totally do it. Like, mm -hmm. that's great. Uh, the third, the third-party thing is just is such is such an in, has been such an ingrained part of the ecosystem for the past fifty years that try, that um trying trying to trying to control whenever games try and control it, it never goes well. No, because, I mean, part of it is just that, like, we're such an internet community, you know, like, 
there's you know say what you want about the the gaming community there are there are gatekeepers and there are people that are just like trying to have fun like like myself you know i don't really want to tell people how to play ever um so for the man to try to tell us all how to play it's just like you don't know your audience we know oh. more than you about your game usually <laughs> you know when that whole thing went down i did a postmortem on it cuz i was at ground zero for a lot of it and i had likened their approach to um to vin to when Vince McMahon first tried to do football with the XFL back in 2001 because uh, because the the vibe that I got, the vibe that I got was somebody stepping into a culture that they had no idea how it worked yeah that makes sense um yeah and it, it happens with a lot of media and a lot of um you know not just not just um, not just RPGs, video games, movies. Like they don't know. Basically, they don't realize what a resource you know the community is. And to show the community that it's keeping you alive, such disrespect. I think that that's. I think that it's just foolish. You know. Well, what are you what are you gonna do though? Car um, watch karma play out. Yeah, that's true. But. With with that in mind, given given the whole time travel thing, I'm curious if you are going to be putting in some story seeds because this is this is definitely an unconventional approach yes. when it comes to the setting that you have. Yeah. So, um, like there there is a whole rich meta plot and culture um, that can be you know accessed and gleaned, but I also didn't want it to be like. Um, I didn't want it to be the the sort of like rigid structure for players. Like my idea was mostly that I want people to be able to come across the same characters from different timelines and them being slightly different and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And even your PCs, like there are powers um, that aren't in the light rules where you like you're pulling in some someone that looks exactly like you from a different timeline. You know, and you can do that to get information, or you can use them to basically have them attack an enemy. You know, like they come in and they immediately sort of trust you and will stab your your opponent in the back. You know, like that's a thing you can do in this game. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted, you know, like I really wanted it to be both um, full of options for players and GMs to come to like build their own stories, but I also wanted it to be loose enough that the like that they don't have any set rules i'm a big believer in stock characters you know like i really like the blades in the dark kind of did that so you know your your characters have all these sort of selections but it's just a name and an occupation each one is different you know mm -hmm. your your two different games of blades in the dark will be completely different for instance mm -hmm. now what are you shooting for as far as a total page count uh the final rules page count is let me, let me read it um, it's like 315, I think. For a core book, yeah, that de that definitely fits. And I do want to get, I do want to give my congrats for the for how well the Kickstarter is done. Um, at yeah. the time of this recording, you're at 4.4 thousand. You were only asking for 10k. No, uh, 1,000. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, where yeah. I got 10k from. Yeah. Um, that's the one thing that like I wasn't able really to. Um, get off of the internet was marketing. Um, I reached out to a bunch of people to review the game, and like so many people were like, "Pay me one hundred and fifty dollars, and I'll I'll make like a minute video." And that just felt really like antithetical to that. Reviewers were immediately trying to like, you know, basically take money. I, I guess that that might be the way, but I didn't know, you know, at the time. So marketing was really hard um, for this game because it it is very niche, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's it definitely is, and I don't I don't like doing that whole pay, paid for review thing. I never I've I've never yeah. I'm, I have that. to say I'm I'm great I'm grateful for this. You know this is this has been a very pleasant experience. You know yeah, and I know I know that for some people that's how that's how they make their bag. And if you're gonna get that bread, get it. But um, I'm more interest I'm more interested in in building um, links so that people will so that people would be willing to 
keep making stuff and keep coming back. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's, that's my hope too. Like, I just want people that, you know, to tell their stories and have fun. Mm-hmm. But with that said, I'll certainly be keeping an eye out for, for it. And I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Absolutely. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Okay. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!